Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, your patience today. Uh, today's guest at Authors at Google New York is Caleb Scharf, who is the director of Columbia Ast Astrobiology Center. He writes the Life Unbounded blog for Scientific American and has written for New Scientist, Science, and Nature, among other publications. Uh, let's see. He is, um, has served as a keynote speaker for the American Museum of Natural History and the Rubin Museum of Art, and is the author of Extrasolar Planets and Astrobiology and the winner of the 2011 Shambliss Astronomical Writing Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Caleb Sharp. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Ooh, wow. <laughs> I guess it's loud enough. Um, thanks. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about a, a story. Um, and it's, it's a story related in this book. And I'm going to give you a little piece of that story today. And it's really a story about strange things in astrophysics and the universe around us. And in particular, it's about how some of the most bizarre and fantastical phenomena in the universe turn out to be surprisingly important. They turn out to be things that matter conceivably to us. They turn out to, to have a strong influence on the particular cosmic environment that we find ourselves in. And I, I think it's this, this story in particular is um, it's somewhat unusual. Oh, there are two mics. That's why it's louder here. <laughs> um, and in as much as this all begins with a theoretical conception that happened more than 200 years ago. And it was a pretty outlandish theoretical conception 200 years ago, and it remained so until really very recently. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about this today, and I'll try to keep this to the 45 minutes, um, and then if anyone has extra questions, I have some extra slides at the end. The story begins here. Not really the place you'd expect a, a story of astrophysics and, and cosmology to begin. This is St. Michael's Parish Church in West Yorkshire in England. And the reason the story begins here is because of this guy, <clears throat> the Reverend John Mitchell. So John Mitchell is a very interesting character. We know a certain amount about him but perhaps not as many details as we should for someone of his stature. Because before John Mitchell was the Reverend John Mitchell running this little church in, in England, he was actually a renowned scientist at the University of Cambridge in England. And this is back in the 1700s. And he was one of the people who founded modern seismology, for example. He's also someone who, together with Henry Cavendish, created a, a special type of balance that enabled them to make the first accurate measurement of the Earth's gravitational field, the gravitational acceleration at the surface of the Earth, and therefore deduce the mass of the Earth, or the weight of the Earth. Why he ended up as a reverend, we don't actually really know. Perhaps this was a more stable, better paid job than being an academic at Cambridge, right? That's, yeah. True in a lot of human history. If you could be in the church, you were probably better off than doing other things. Now, Mitchell, while he was reverent of this church, got interested in other things. He got interested in astronomy. And one of the things that he became particularly fascinated with was the idea that objects like stars could imprint something about themselves on the light that came to us from them. Now, this sounds, if you at all familiar with modern astronomy, that sounds trivial. Of course, that's true. But at the time, this was quite a revolutionary concept. And he gave a presentation in 1783, at the Royal Society in England, where he discussed these ideas. And in particular, he discussed the idea that he'd had based on Newton's physics, which was that if a star has gravity, and if light, as this is the way people thought about light at the time, if light is slowed down by the effect of gravity, so in other words, people were thinking about light just as if you think about throwing tennis balls or baseballs, particles of light would get slowed down by gravity. We now know this isn't the case, but at the time, they didn't know this. 
he made the, the, the suggestion that, well, stars are big, their gravity ought to slow light down. <clears throat> so if we could measure the velocity of light that was being emitted by stars towards us, we would have a measurement of the star's mass. It was a very clever idea. It wasn't quite right, but it was very clever. What was really brilliant was that he took this to the extreme. He said, well, what happens if you have a star so massive, so enormous, that it slows light all the way down to a stop? And so Mitchell actually came up with an idea that was later called the dark star. So he suggested, and this is a, a small quote from what he said at this meeting in, in 1783, that a truly enormous star, perhaps 500 times the size of the sun, would be so big that it could slow down light altogether to a stop. And you would never actually see that star. It would drop out of view. Now this was very, very interesting, except nobody paid it any attention for another 100 plus years. What happened then was Einstein. And this is a very crude overview of, of Einstein's general relativity. I'm sure some of you are much more familiar with this than I am. Einstein came along, and in 1915, he produced his general theory of relativity. So what Einstein realized was that what we had thought of as gravity wasn't quite right. Gravity is really a consequence of what mass does to space around it. Mass distorts space and time around it. A very common way of thinking about this, and it's not a bad analogy, is to think of a rubber sheet. And I'm sure you've heard this is a very, you know, I couldn't think of a more exciting analogy that, that worked as well, so I'll, I'll use it. Um, it. It's a very old, old analogy. Think of a rubber sheet representing space. Three dimensions of space collapse to two dimensions. If you put a weight in that rubber sheet, it will distort. It will bend down. And Einstein realized that this was a more accurate description of what mass does to space around it, and that gravity is simply a consequence of objects trying to follow the shortest path in this distorted space and time. A mass pulls space around it. It bunches it up around itself, and it stretches it down towards itself. And this is a, just a, a silly little illustration to show that. In other words, space is, is stiff but flexible. It actually takes an awful lot of mass concentrated into a very small region to make an appreciable distortion in space. And at the same time Einstein produced his theory of general relativity, almost immediately it came out, people started applying it. And one of the first applications was made by someone called Karl Schwarzschild, who actually did this from the Russian front. He was in the German army in World War I. And I guess this was a good distraction. Um, he, he used Einstein's relativity to produce equations describing what would happen around the simplest sort of object you can imagine, a sphere of mass. And Schwarzschild sent these solutions to, to Einstein, and it became apparent in these solutions that you could have extreme versions of space distortion. If you pack enough mass into a small enough volume, if you make it dense enough, it will pull space inwards, distort it to such an extent that ultimately that object can create what we call an event horizon around itself. An event horizon is simply the place where the curvature of space, the distortion of space, is so extreme that light itself can't escape from there. Now, at this stage, everyone knew that light had the same velocity no matter what. So the event horizon is all about stretching. If you try to have light, or if light tries to escape from within this event horizon, it is stretched to such an extent that you never see it in the external universe. Now, there are all sorts of other fascinating aspects to this, but I, I'm going to skip most of those and focus on something very particular. So here was Mitchell's idea again, that there could be objects that were so massive, in this case so massive and so dense, that they would essentially vanish from view. They would drop out of normal existence. 
because light is the ultimate measuring tool. And so if light can't escape, nothing else can either. All sorts of other things happen at the event horizon. Time slows down for external observers and so on. So it's a very interesting concept. And it was a very theoretical concept. Einstein hated it, in fact. Einstein did not like this idea. He felt it was nonsensical that the universe couldn't conceivably actually make such objects. Yes, the equation said you could, but there was no way the universe could do this. Let me just show you a little movie um, just to illustrate this most simple of all um, event horizons, what became known as black holes. So Mitchell's dark stars transformed into black holes. That, that's a whole other story as well that, that involves a great deal of scientific work to convince everyone these things could be real. So this is a little movie just, just for fun. And it's, it's, it's accurate, scientifically accurate. What you'll see is a small journey into a black hole. And you'll see the event horizon as a dark object. And there's a, there's a red grid on it. That red grid is, is purely um, for artistic effect, just to show you the distortion of light. Because what a black hole does more than anything else in the universe is distort light around it. And it acts a bit like a lens. And so you'll see light in all sorts of peculiar circular patterns around this object. And it's because the light is being wrapped around and around close to the event horizon before it gets to you. So you actually see multiple images of what's behind. So let me just set that in motion. And it's really just to, to give you a feeling for this. What you'll see, you'll begin to see this grid on the black hole. And you notice you can see both north and south poles of the event horizon. It's because the light is bent around. So there's no place to hide around a black hole. You will be seen no matter where you are, because the light coming from you will get bent around. Now, pretty soon, it's going to hit. Um, it's actually going to go into, it's getting to what's called the photosphere, where light can actually orbit the black hole. Now it's going to hit the event horizon in a moment. Boom, there it goes into the event horizon. And the universe becomes extremely distorted if you are looking out from, from that position. OK, that's fun. This is good stuff. This is sort of, you know, what you see in science fiction and so on. And there have been many things written about the peculiar way in which your perception of the world would change if you dropped into a black hole. These objects are extremely compact. These objects would have to be extremely compact to distort space and time as much. And I just show you three, uh, a couple of quick slides just to illustrate that, because it's important for what I'm going to show you next about the real universe. The size of black hole event horizon. So I, I picked this uh, as a, for a personal reason, that it's, it's a small island um, off the coast of Europe. And what is interesting is that the event horizon that an object creates around itself is actually extremely small. And it's because space-time gets um, distorted to such an extent. So a, a black hole, an object containing 10 times the mass of our sun, squeezed inside its event horizon would only be 37 miles across. So it would actually just block out London and the main road, the main highway that goes around London, which is called the M25. And if you've ever been on the M25, the idea of time slowing down at the event horizon is, is writ large. <clears throat> Maybe some of you have. Or it could be the beltway around DC as well. Um, so a, a 10 solar mass black hole is an astrophysically plausible object, and, but it would only be 37 miles across. The event horizon would only be 37 miles across. Let me just show you a couple more examples. And again, this is relevant for what I'll show you next. Um, let's go a bit bigger. What about 100,000 suns? I mean, I haven't told you that these things exist, but let's just do it anyway. Well, 100,000 suns um, packed into an event horizon would fit easily inside our sun. So these are extraordinarily compact and dense objects. If we go up in scale a little bit, it's not a particularly pretty picture. Um, something 4 million times the mass of the sun. And there's a reason I'm using 4 million times the mass of the sun, as you'll see momentarily. Um, something that size, the event horizon would fit easily inside the orbit of Mercury. So on an astrophysical scale, these things are tiny, given the amount of matter in them. One last one. What about a billion times the mass of the sun? Well, a, whoops, I'm sorry, a, an object a billion times the mass of the sun would have an event horizon that fits readily within the orbit of Neptune in our solar system. Again, extraordinarily compact, and that's an important thing to remember. So 
we now know these things are real, at least with 99.9, .9, maybe 9% certainty. And in fact, the best examples, the most convincing examples, are indeed these things that are millions to billions of times the mass of our sun. Let me show you one of the clearest pieces of evidence. So what I'm going to play for you is a tiny little movie, a time-lapse movie over a number of years of the motion of stars at the very center of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Okay, now, this has been cleaned up, but what you see is an accurate representation of the motion of these stars and their relative brightnesses. So let me just run that. It runs a little bit, then it zooms in. And you'll see things are kind of wiggling around in the middle. And there's a bit of a, you'll see one thing get a bit of a kick. There it goes. Let's zoom in on that. And you can see the scale here. We're looking at a region of space, maybe 10 to 15 light days across. Now, there's a star in the middle of our galaxy that has this rather dramatic orbit. Okay. It's dramatic because at the, the point where it is closest to something in the middle, you can't really see what's there. And in fact, it's very hard to see what's there, even with the best telescopes. There isn't much light coming from that apparent center point for these orbits. At the closest point to that center, this star, at its fastest motion in the orbit, is moving at about 3,700 kilometers a second. Just for comparison, Mercury goes around the sun at about 60 kilometers a second. What this tells us is that there is an enormous mass packed into a tiny region in the very center of our galaxy. If you do the numbers, you find it's about 4 million times the mass of our sun. We now think that this is a supermassive black hole living in the center of our galaxy, which is interesting, and we'll come back to that. That's not the only way we can spot these things now. In fact, the, the most common way that we see signs of black holes in the universe is because they're not black at all, or at least what's going on around them is not black. When you drop matter into a black hole, it gets torn apart, it gets shredded, and it gets accelerated. And you can do it in all sorts of different ways, and you get the same outcome. Dropping something into a black hole means it will accelerate eventually to close to the speed of light. That's before it reaches the event horizon. So if anything happens to it on the way, if it collides with something else, energy can be released. And I, the analogy I like to use is water going down the, the plug hole in your bathtub and often it makes noise, it gurgles, right? It's essentially the same process. The, the, the gurgling is the energy of motion of the water as it swirls around being converted into sound waves that, that bounce back out into the room, okay? It's kind of the same thing that happens around black holes, right? but on a much, much grander scale. So matter falling into black holes doesn't go quietly. And that energy that it can produce in the form of light in the form of subatomic particles, because it, you're, you're tearing stuff apart and accelerating it, spews back out into the universe. So a more realistic look at what happens as you fall towards a black hole is represented in this short movie. And I should say one other thing. Most black holes have spin. Okay? Just like anything else, like a planet, like a star, black holes spin. Now, it's, it's a very weird thing because you can't really see the black hole. You just have this event horizon. But because they have distorted space so much, they actually drag it around with them as they spin. It's like having a thick rug and you're pulling it around. And so the very geometry of space gets pulled around with the spin of a black hole. And that means it is impossible to stand still around a spinning black hole. So this just ramps up the acceleration of matter that falls into the black hole. Black holes can also have electrical charge. And this gets very complex. It's one of the most complex aspects of black holes. But it means that you can have additional mechanisms that accelerate matter. It's like having the Large Hadron Collider in a natural form, okay, except stuff doesn't just go around in a ring. It can jet out. So let me just show you this movie. And this is, again, reasonably, you know, as far as we know, quite accurate representation. Now we're falling into a spinning charged black hole that has matter around it, matter that is itself falling in, 
getting accelerated, getting torn apart, and some of that energy of motion is being converted into other forms as the matter sort of gurgles down the drain. So you can see the spinning black hole, you see matter swirling around, and it's also there are um, jets or streams of accelerated particles leaving from just outside the event horizon and shooting back out into the universe. They're so accelerated that even the gravity of the black hole outside the event horizon doesn't really slow them down very much. So that's a theoretical picture. I'll just let it run a little bit, although all it does is get very, very bright, and then it stops. In the real universe, we see this all over the place. Let me just put up a few images here. This is just a small selection of maps made using radio telescopes that have targeted precisely this sort of situation. And you can probably see in some of these images, and I'll show you more in a moment, that there are tiny little bright specks, and then there are these thread-like streams or jets coming out of them that then seemingly crash into something in the intergalactic space um, and turn into these great lobes of particles. What we're looking at is the cooling of electrons that have been accelerated around supermassive black holes, just like a particle accelerator. And as they cool down, they emit radio waves, radio emission. The size of these structures, again, I'll, I'll illustrate this a little bit more, but they're between a few tens of thousands of light years across to hundreds of thousands of light years across. They're absolutely enormous. To cut a very long story short, we now realize that Black holes that have matter falling into them are actually capable of the most efficient conversion of matter to energy in the universe. You can produce energy this way even better than nuclear fusion. In fact, in optimal cases, it can be 50 times more efficient at getting energy out of a certain amount of matter than the equivalent nuclear fusion. Okay, it's just gravity. Gravity is really potent, um, and black holes, because of their nature, uh, like a turbocharged version of, of a normal gravity well. So this raises all sorts of interesting questions. There's all this energy being produced by black holes. They're not hiding away at all. Now, they don't, not all black holes are in this situation, but a large number are, and across cosmic time, across the last 13.8 billion years, this kind of thing has gone on a lot. To show you a couple more examples, this is a particularly beautiful example this is a galaxy called M87. It's not too far away from us. Now, what you see here is this great yellowish, greenish haze are actually the stars of the galaxy. You can't distinguish individual stars. There are probably a few hundred billion stars there. And in the very center of this galaxy is a supermassive black hole eating matter, eating gas, eating stars, eating stuff. And it's generating one of these streams, one of these jets of accelerated particles. And you can see it glowing. And it's glowing in ultraviolet light. And again, it's these electrons that have been accelerated and shot across intergalactic space or interstellar space. And this structure is, is a few tens of thousands of light years across. They're really quite remarkable because it looks kind of tiny, right? It looks like the sort of thing you might see under a microscope, but it's not that at all. Here's another example, and it's just to show you some pretty pictures. It's always, this is one of the beauties of astronomy is you have pretty pictures to show. This is a galaxy called Centaurus A. Again, not too far from us. It's kind of a messy galaxy, but I think you can see that on, on the top and bottom there are these sort of strange sort of plumes coming out. And there too is a supermassive black hole deep inside this galaxy. And in fact, we've discovered that our Milky Way is not alone in having a supermassive black hole in its center. Pretty much every galaxy in the universe has some kind of supermassive black hole in the center. Some of them even have more than one, which is another story, but that's, that's just to, to tell you. Just to go back to this notion of scale, because I think it's, it's, it's very interesting and it's quite astonishing. Here's another galaxy. Okay, it doesn't look very interesting. It's, it's, uh, it's about 600... Uh, yeah, yes, it's about 600 million light years from us. It's called Cygnus A. This is a Hubble Space Telescope image of it in visible light. It's kind of a sort of distorted, mucky looking thing. But let's put it in context. Let's shrink it down. Now let's put that map 
of the stuff coming from the black hole up. So I think you can see <laughs> that the black hole in the center is producing a pretty big structure. That structure end to end is about 500,000 light years across. So it vastly ex outreaches the, the size of the stars in the galaxy, the visible part of the galaxy. And remember the black hole itself, this one is about a billion or so solar masses, would fit readily inside our solar system. Right? And this galaxy probably has 100 billion solar systems in it. So it's, 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 it's a very tiny, tiny thing. It's like a bacterium suddenly inflating a balloon the size of Manhattan. Okay. So as we've learned more about this, it's raised a number of questions. And a very interesting question has been, does this energy do anything other than just make these extraordinary, beautiful, and majestic structures in the universe? And this is something that we've really learned a great deal about in the last 10 to 15 years. And what we've learned is starting to revolutionize our vision of not just black holes, but how our whole universe comes to be the way it is, how it evolves, how it changes with time. Let me just say a little bit about that. This is another galaxy. And I'm showing you this because it's one of those places every so often something comes along and it's, it's like finding that rare species that suddenly illuminates the whole tree of life. You go, ah, that's what it is. We've had this question, well, where does it, you know, how does this energy relate to everything that we see? What does it do? Yeah, okay, black holes are spewing energy out in the universe. What does it do? Well, this is one great example that really, for many people in this field, pinned it down a number of years ago. This is another galaxy. This, this is a galaxy called Perseus A. It's about 250 million light years from us. It doesn't look too un unusual or, or it looked a little messy. Perseus A is, like many galaxies, part of a greater collection of galaxies. Galaxies tend to come in what we call clusters. So Perseus A is actually in a system of a few hundred to a few thousand other galaxies that are all sort of gathered together across a, maybe a, a 10 million light year region. And in these situations, these are kind of the, the, the mountains in the distribution of stuff in our universe. In these places, the galaxies are typically surrounded by very hot gas, gas between the galaxies. It's like an atmosphere surrounding them. It's very, very tenuous. To us, it would be like vacuum. Okay, but on these large scales, it's, it's quite substantial. And this gas is very, very hot, and you can see it because it cools down by emitting x-rays. Okay. It's just it's, it's a hot version of things. It's, it's hotter than your typical incandescent lamp, and so the energy that's emitted by the atoms in it um, tends to be in the X-ray part of the spectrum. We can make a map of that X-ray light and kind of see the atmosphere surrounding all of these galaxies at once. It's a really neat trick to be able to do. And luckily, we now have instruments that can do this. So let me show you that X-ray map. Okay, now it may look a little odd to start with, so I'm going to explain what's going on here because this is, I hesitate to call it a Rosetta Stone, but it, it definitely um, was something that when we saw it kind of changed everyone's view. So the galaxy is in the middle here. You can't really see it because we're looking in X-ray light. What you can see is that this hot atmosphere surrounding all these galaxies is far from uniform. There's all sorts of interesting structure in here. There is a supermassive black hole in the center of that galaxy, Perseus A. And it's doing what all the others tend to do when they get fed. It's, it's shooting out jets of material and, and great clouds of, of subatomic particles. Except in this case, because it's inside this structure, you see these darker regions. Okay, there are a few sort of dark patches, some of them even quite far out. Those are bubbles. Those are literally bubbles. It is inflating these holes inside this atmosphere, just as if you'd taken a straw and put it in your milkshake, right? Like all annoying people do. Sorry, sorry well, my children do. Um, and the highly energetic material coming from around the black hole literally inflates 
bubbles in this atmosphere. And the bubbles are buoyant. This is a gravitational system, so it's just like a bubble in a milkshake, a bubble in the, the ocean. It floats up, and you can see that there are darker patches. Um, there's the one in the upper middle right-hand side there. That's floating up through this atmosphere. It's on a scale of hundreds of thousands of light years. Okay. And the time scale of which the black hole burps these things out is on a similar scale, 100,000 years, maybe a million years. Every time it gets fed, it does this. You may be able to see something else in here. And I, and I should say, this gas, okay, what this gas really wants to do is cool down and make new galaxies and make new stars. Right? It's trying to do that, but the black hole is disrupting it. You may be able to see, uh, it's always hard with this image, I try not to manipulate it too much, but there are sort of ripples in this image, concentric ripples coming from the center, very subtle features. Those ripples are sound waves that are set in motion by these bubbles. Okay. And the sound waves spread out across this whole system. The sound waves peak to peak, uh, maybe 100,000 light years. So the pitch of these sound waves is about 57 octaves below human hearing. It's a very deep note being played by the black hole. And the power being output in these sound waves, power being converted into these sound waves, is a trillion, trillion, trillion watts, roughly, 10 to the 37 watts. Okay, and that's being propagated out across about a million years, light years of, of space. That energy is helping moderate what this atmosphere does. It's actually helping prevent this gas turning into new stars and galaxies. What this means is that, and this happens actually in more than 70% of structures like this. If you go and find a cluster of galaxies anywhere in the universe, you'll see this kind of thing happening more often than not. So this really convinced many of us that supermassive black holes are playing a very important role in regulating the way in which the universe makes stars and makes galaxies. Okay. But this is still relatively nearby. So the question was, is this happening early on? If it's happening early on, then it means that black holes and galaxies and stars have this intimate relationship that we hadn't previously understood. Well, it turns out that it does. And I have to show you this because this is one of my favorite things. This is work I did, so I have to show you. Right? Um, and I'm very proud of it because it, it really, for me at least, convince me. It doesn't look very impressive, but I'll, it, maybe it will be more so when I tell you what it is. So here's a, a, a sort of murky looking thing in the center here. You can ignore the bright thing up on the upper right hand side. That's just an annoying star that got in the way. What we're looking at is a teenage galaxy. Okay. This is an object. This image was made using one of the giant Keck telescopes in Hawaii. It's a seven hour exposure time. So if you think when you take your digital camera, right, that's a tiny fraction of a second to get the typical exposure. This is seven hours worth of exposure time. What we're looking at is the ultraviolet light coming from a baby galaxy or a teenage galaxy. That light has been traveling towards us for 12 billion years. So this is way, way back, uh, pretty much at the dawn of the formation and evolution of galaxies. And our question was, okay, that's fabulous, but is there a supermassive black hole there 12 billion years ago? Was it, was it there? Was it doing anything? Could it have played a role in the, the later evolution of this system? Because this system will end up looking like the things we see today. And so what we did was we used an X-ray telescope, in fact, used NASA's great observatory called Chandra, which is an orbiting X-ray telescope. You have to do X-ray astronomy from space because our atmosphere blocks most X-rays. And so we looked for high energy phenomena. We looked for signs of these sort of subatomic particle acceleration that black holes are so good at. And we saw this. Okay. We saw a great mess of stuff. <laughs> okay. there, this image actually, I, I should confess, this image contains 150 photons of light. Okay. 
And so it's not a particularly impressive image, but it took 40 hours to get those 150 photons. And each one of those 150 photons took 12 billion years to get to us. What it shows is a supermassive black hole doing exactly what it does in today's universe. It's spewing out these jets, these, these streams of energetic particles, which is why this blue thing is sort of elongated. Now, there are many technical aspects to this, but it turns out that because the universe itself was smaller 12 billion years ago, more compact, right, the universe is expanding. So if you go back in time, it was smaller. It turns out that shrunken scale in the universe means that the way in which the energy pouring out from around the black hole is converted into other things is different than it is today. And in fact, we think that difference means that the black hole had even greater power over what was going on in these teenage galaxies and probably stunted their growth. Without this sort of phenomena, these galaxies would grow to be vast, enormous things, the likes of which we don't see in the real universe. So black holes turn out to be a critical component, kind of keeping things in light. Okay, they're like the ultimate gatekeeper. And you can't make more stars, I'm sorry, it's finished. Um, and that's the role they play. So let me, I'm almost done with this piece of the talk, because I know questions would be fun. Um, what we have learned, I've shown you a little bit of some of the evidence of many other aspects to this, many other extremely um, interesting pieces of research. We now understand that supermassive black holes, that now why they exist in the center of every galaxy, I've, I've skirted over. Okay, because we don't entirely know their origin. We, we suspect it may be the merger of black holes. You, know, you take two small black holes, you make a bigger black hole, and that keeps going on and so on. Um, we're not totally sure about how they grow. What we do know is that they are intimately linked to the properties of pretty much all the galaxies we see around us. So for example, uh, these sorts of galaxies, in today's universe, we find this remarkable relationship. If you measure the mass of the stars in the middle of these galaxies, which you can do with various telescopic techniques, and then make an estimate of the mass of the black hole at the middle, you find that the black hole is always about one thousandth the mass of the stars, no matter which galaxy it is. There's a universal rule. I wish I knew why it was that. <laughs> None of us do. But it points towards a very intimate relationship. But then there are places that don't follow this relationship, galaxies like these, and our galaxy is one of these. Okay. You don't see this relationship. So it's very interesting. We're not sure what that means yet. If there are more questions about it, I have a few more slides after that I, I can show you. Let me just finish up this piece, though. So, to kind of wrap this up into a bigger vision, where does this lead us? What does this mean? Well, let's just think about the observable universe for a moment. The observable universe, by which I mean the universe that we can see because light has had time to get to us from its from objects, right? So it's about 13.8 billion years back in time that we can see. The observable universe contains more than 100 billion galaxies. This is a, actually a rendering based on a real survey of galaxies. Okay, so the positions and sort of general size and shape of these galaxies is accurate. Over, this is the universe around us, it's about 400,000 galaxies around us. The observable universe contains over 100 billion galaxies. Maybe it's 300 billion, maybe it's 400 billion, but it's probably not many more than that. So it's a finite number. And these galaxies contain a finite number of stars, maybe about 10 to the 22 stars, okay, over six, 10 sextillion. Okay. I tried to work this out in, in Google numbers, but didn't manage to do that in time. It's a finite number, but it's an enormous number. And it's a number, just to, it's a nice quote. Carl Sagan once said, it's more, there are more stars in the universe than all the grains of sand and all the beaches of planet Earth. He's absolutely right. But that's a finite number of grains. Okay, 
which is interesting. Why is it this number? And it's particularly interesting, to me at least, because stars and the galaxies in them, but the stars in particular, stars are the places that produce all the elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. Okay, this is an old, old almost cliched thing to say. Right, that the, the atoms of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen in our bodies were once millions of miles down in the center of stars that are now long gone. Okay, but that, that is just how it was. It, it is true. Stars produce all the heavy elements that produce things like planets, produce the chemistry of the universe, okay, and eventually things like life, at least here on Earth. So there is a connection between the, pr the actual number of stars that the universe has produced, has ever produced over its existence, and the richness of elements and the possibilities for chemistry and for the environments of life. And so I'll stop with this slide. I have a few more things I could say. If anyone wants to see it, they can ask a question about that. It'll take five more minutes and a couple more slides. If not, we can just go to other questions. But I think one of the most fascinating things for me, and this is a particular topic in the book, it's very speculative, but it's very interesting because these numbers of stars, the numbers of galaxies, are clearly intimately tied to the coevolution of galaxies and supermassive black holes. Who would have thought? I know John Mitchell didn't think this in the 1700s, and I'm pretty sure. Um, when Schwarzschild and Einstein were fighting it out over whether black holes could actually exist or not, anyone could conceive that such fantastical and bizarre objects could have any real relevance to the nature of the universe around us. But it seems that they do at some level. And our own environment, our own cosmic environment, is a product of all this. And so it's a very interesting question. What is our link to black holes? So I can stop there. I have a few more slides if anyone is interested, or we can just ask, uh, go for general questions. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Or shall I tell you the next little bit of the story? <laughs> I had oh. a few questions. Um, one of them is you were talking about how there were these particles of energy that were actually streaming out of the black hole. Yeah. And you said they were moving so fast that the black hole couldn't trap them. Right. Does that mean they're moving faster than light would? No, well, it's a good question. So what, what I mean is that they are being, um, they're, they're all leaving before they get to the event horizon. Okay, so all of this is happening close to, but not at the event horizon. So anything that does make it to the event horizon is gone, absolutely. This is stuff that's going on maybe um, two, three, four event horizons out. Okay, and because of that, yes, these, these particles, they can be accelerated very close to the speed of light, but obviously nothing um, can travel faster than light and certainly nothing with, with mass can be accelerated. Um, even to the speed of light. It gets very close, but not, not quite exactly. So, yeah, so it, again, it's, it's the analogy of stuff going down the, the drain. It's, you know, you hear the sound not from necessarily deep in the drain, but, but on the edge, on stuff where it's turbulent, where it's getting mixed up. But yeah, that's a good question. So the other question was, does the rotation of the black hole have an impact on the, the sort of flat spiral shape of the galaxy? <laughs> I, yeah, so good question. I, you know, I think the answer is no. <laughs> and the reason is that it's on such a small scale compared to the grand spiral structure of a galaxy. So our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. And the spiral structures you see are on similar scales. They, they stretch for maybe 50,000 light years. Um, the, the motion of the central supermassive black hole is all happening as I show, on the scale of a few times the radius of our solar system. So it's a tiny, tiny scale. Now, I, what is interesting is people have started to look to see whether, in cases where we can observe the properties of the matter swirling around the black hole, right, which is a kind of a giveaway to the orientation of the black hole, right, if it's spinning, 
people started to try to look to see whether the orientation of the stuff swirling closest to the black hole is the same as the orientation, if it's a, if it's a galaxy like ours, a spiral galaxy that has a definite plane of, of motion, if that orientation is the same. And it looks like it's often close, but not always perfectly aligned. And we don't quite know why. Maybe sometimes um, in the formation process of these supermassive black holes, they, they end up being tilted. Right? And it's like a gyroscope. It's very hard to untilt it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, it's, it, it, again, it's a very good question because you, you might readily feel that there should be some connection. It doesn't seem to be that there's a direct physical connection because of the sheer difference in scale. And the scale on which the black hole is dragging space around with it, okay, that most extreme um, f effect, is also very small. It's a few event horizons away from the black hole. And the Earth drags space around with it, right? but it's at a tiny level. And people have put up satellite, satellites to measure this. And it's, it's a, it's a minute, minute effect. It's much greater around black holes, but still um, restricted. Sorry, my question. Thanks for coming. Um, I had read a theory that was speculating that the event horizon of black holes could potentially be like a Big Bang event, possibly creating kind of a, a new universe in another dimension. And I was just wondering your thoughts on that, and if there's <laughs> any way that we can eventually prove or disprove that at this point. Right. Well, I'll confess that I'm not an expert on the more esoteric <laughs> aspects of, of this. Uh, you know, people have long played around with the equations for objects like black holes. And the interesting thing about you know, Einstein's description of the distortion of space and time is when you have a mass, um, whether it's spinning or not, there are, you can often find different mathematical solutions for different bits, different regimes. So for example, you can find mathematical solutions that let you sort of uh, extrapolate easily across the event horizon. Um, I think it's true some of these solutions indicate that you know, maybe there's a sort of wormhole that you go through the event horizon and rather than end up in the middle of this black hole, there's actually a, a tunnel through space or to somewhere else or some other time or other dimension or whatever. My understanding is that, that now people feel that all those solutions are unstable. They're inherently unstable. As soon as you put anything there, it all collapses. So there's no way you can you know, go to another universe or that the black hole can itself be the progenitor of another universe in some other parallel um, reality. Um, I, you know, I, yeah, so I, my feeling, my personal feeling is, because the other question that comes up is, well, where does all that matter go inside the black hole? What is it? We know that well, as far as we know, there is nothing that can support matter once it, it enters inside its own event horizon because particles would have to be moving faster than light in order to provide the pressure needed to stop something from just collapsing to nothingness. The thing about, so people then say, well, there's a singularity at the center of the black hole, a point of infinite density. That's what the general relativity equations tell us. The trouble is, general relativity does not work on a quantum scale. It's incomplete. It's a good description on large scales, but not on very small scales. At small scales, space is granular. At least this is what we now believe. And it's because at a quantum scale, things are uncertain. Um, so one picture that people have come up with, and certainly it comes out of string theory, is the idea that at the center of the black hole is effectively a very exotic and energetic type of subatomic particle. That's what it all comes down to. It's a string that's so excited that its mass is 10 billion times the mass of the sun. And what's neat about that idea is, um, and again, this is getting a little technical, but this notion of Hawking radiation. So Stephen Hawking proposed that black holes can actually evaporate. Okay, and again, it's because of quantum things going on close to the event horizon. I won't go into it in detail, but the upshot is a black hole, given enough time, will eventually evaporate away. It, 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 leave, it, it emits radiation, particles, whatever. Um, but then that begs the question, what happens if it evaporates all the way down to nothing? <laughs> what are you left with? Because right? everything happens with this event horizon. Uh, string theory kind of gives a, a sort of elegant answer to that, which is eventually you're just left with 
a normal subatomic particle. Black hole evaporates, evaporates, evaporates. It gets smaller and smaller. It becomes microscopic. And then it becomes some sort of exotic particle, maybe a Higgs boson. Well, it wouldn't be a boson, but it would be <laughs> a fermion. Um, and then eventually, it'll just end up as a boring old electron. And that's it. It's gone. It's just evaporated back to constituent subatomic bits. Uh, anyway, sorry. That, that, I'm not sure that really <laughs> answers your question. <laughs> Uh, so my question is that you were speaking about how at the beginning of the universe creation that there were these black holes in the teenage galaxy you showed. Mm -hmm. So I just previously thought that black holes were formed because so much time passed that matter kind of collected. Is it more so that black holes were created in the Big Bang and these supermassive black holes especially, <coughs> or are they created just with a lot of time passing? Right. So it's a great question. Um, we think that the majority of black holes, and I didn't really get into this because I, I put the emphasis on these, these supermassive versions. The majority of black holes are actually about 10 times the mass of our sun. And there should be thousands of those in our galaxy. They're produced all the time by the collapse of very old stars, stars that burn through their nuclear fuel. Once they burn through that nuclear fuel, they burn elements, they, they fuse elements up to about iron. And at that point, it's, it's a break-even prospect for generating energy. And so fusion kind of stops. And the core of these stars tends to collapse. And we think, in many cases, can make a small black hole. Small meaning maybe 10 times the mass of our sun. And that's been going on forever. These giant things in the middle of galaxies, um, I think most people would say are not related to anything that might happen in the very, very early universe, right? in the exotic mix of particles and quantum fields in the very early universe. These are probably produced because the conditions in the young universe before you had many stars were rather different than today. As soon as you begin to make heavy elements, you change the way in which gas can accumulate. Okay, and it's to do with some kind of esoteric physics about cooling. It turns out that heavy elements act like a coolant for gas. And the cooler gas can get, and the quicker it can cool down, the more efficiently it can make stars and galaxies. We think in the early universe, things were a little bit different because you didn't have all these heavy elements. So it might be possible that a single cloud of gas under its own gravity could collapse to make a supermassive black hole in pretty short time, relatively short time, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. So one idea for where these supermassive black holes come from is that they're, they're part of kind of the seeding material for galaxies. Um, they're, not, they're not a necessary seed for a galaxy, but they're just part of the whole initial process of making any of the structures we see in the universe. So it's, yeah, so it, it, you know, it, it's kind of a, they're probably not anything as exotic as some remnant of you know, quantum fields in the early universe. Um, they're probably more to do with complex gas physics. That's, that answers the question. Any other questions? Nope. Uh, yeah, you uh, kind of mentioned these plumes that uh, these different uh, black holes will emit from galaxies. I was just wondering about our own galaxy, if we can see any sort of a plume or anything going on ah, thank you. where we are. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Let me show you. A, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip through a couple of slides to show you this. So this has been an interesting question. What about our own galaxy? Now, we had thought until very recently that the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy was pretty quiet. It wasn't getting fed much matter. It wasn't doing a great deal. And it, that's been kind of interesting, because it turns out we, we think our galaxy, again, I'll just go through this a little fast. Um, our galaxy belongs to a kind of special category of galaxy known as a Green Valley galaxy. And that's a galaxy that's in transition. We're no longer making as many stars on a given year as we used to. We make maybe two or three stars a year are formed in our galaxy. Remember, our galaxy has 200 billion stars, so you know it's a small fraction. Um, it used to do a lot more. And there are other galaxies, redder galaxies, that don't do this at all anymore. What's interesting is there seems to be a relationship between 
a galaxy being a Green Valley galaxy and what's happening with the supermassive black hole in the middle. Most Green Valley galaxies that we see out in the universe have black holes that are much more active in their center. They actually, they are producing these plumes and these jets and so on. But we hadn't thought that our galaxy was doing this. What's interesting is we're now seeing evidence that it is. So this, very briefly, this is a map of gamma ray emission coming from our galaxy. So this is really, you're looking at the plane of our galaxy across the center of this map. And you can see there are these two structures. This was discovered about two years ago. These two structures, these great regions of gamma ray emission coming above and below the center of our galaxy. What we think is going on is this, that in fact our galaxy does have these bubbles around it. Uh, but they were produced maybe sometime in the last 100,000 years, maybe sometime in the last million years by the supermassive black hole in the middle. So it's one of these interesting things of cosmic coincidence, right, where we happen to exist at a time when our black hole is not currently actively eating matter and producing energy, but it did a while back. So it may actually be that our galaxy is much more active. Our black hole is, is doing a lot more than we had given it credit for. Um, and let's see, uh, oh, and, and the interesting thing is uh, next year, or the next few months, we now know there is a blob of stuff heading, this is obviously an animation, a blob of stuff, that red thing, heading for the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Astronomers spotted this a few years ago. It's on track. Depending on what it is, it may get shredded, and we may get a small version of this black hole eating happening right in our backyard. And that will help inform us whether or not this is really true, that our black hole on a cosmic time scale is actually an awful lot noisier than we had given it credit for. Um, so, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. It was a good excuse for me to show the rest of the <laughs> slides. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.